we're not going to go through the whole book, of course, there's 50 chapters in it, it could take a long time, but it's very important, of course, I'm not putting the first 11 chapters more superior than the rest, but the reason I'm going to look at the first 11 chapters over the course of time is because these 11 chapters were very, very, very important. Of course, all of all, all, all God's word is very important, but these 11 chapters, we need this as the foundation. The foundation, of course, has been under attack more than any other part of Scripture, as well as the book of Revelation. These first 11 chapters. But just before we read that, I've just looked here and seen this sheet, of course. On this, we the next Saturday morning to do with the harvest. If you would like to help in bringing something to the harvest supper or flower arrangement to the church, please put your name beside you. We appreciate your help and kindness. Um, the sheet is on the table there as you want to be free. If you bring it down there, just put your name beside if you're going to bring something for the harvest next weekend. Thank you so much. The book of Genesis is the easiest book to find, of course, it's the very beginning, the first book of the Bible. Um, we're just going to read the first verse today. It's more of an introduction, an introductory sermon. Um, we'll unpack the first verse towards the end of this, just to show how important this book is. So it's Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're just going to look at, zoom in on this morning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Bible has to be the greatest influence, impact in the history of mankind ever produced. The Bible is the best-selling book. Maybe that's a bit of a surprise for some here today, but the Bible is actually the best-selling book of all time. With an estimation of around 5 billion copies sold to date. 5 billion copies sold to date. Now, there's a thing came through on the phone up the Belfast Telegraph a number of days ago. And this person declared that Northern Ireland has 1.5 million Christians in it. It's just nonsense. Total delusion. There's only 1.9 million people in Northern Ireland. So basically three quarters of the people, more than three quarters of the people in Northern Ireland are supposed to be Christians. It shows you the complete delusion. Why am I saying that? Because the Bible, there's been approximately 5 billion copies sold to date, all down through church history, of course. And that was a lot, a lot of copies, but many have put the Bible into practice. That is the key. And many people in homes have Bibles in their homes, actually, here like a, a, like a good luck charm to someone. I don't like saying that phrase, but that's a reality. It's just gathering dust. To be saved, you see, you practice the Bible, you put the words which the Lord has spoken, you put them into practice. The Bible transforms the believer's life. As James reminds us, just not be a hearer of the word, but also a doer. The Bible is a compilation of 66 books, well, maybe 40 different authors in total, and the book of Genesis is the foundation of all of them. The book of Genesis is the foundation of all the rest of the books in the Bible. This is why it is important we need to get this book, Genesis, correctly interpreted in our minds. Without the book of Genesis, the scriptures would be like a bridge without a support. The name Genesis means beginning, and this book gives vital information concerning the origin of all things. 
The book of Genesis consists of the origin of the universe, the origin of order and complexity, the origin of the solar system, the origin of the atmosphere and hydrosphere, the origin of life, the origin of man, the origin of marriage, the origin of evil, the origin of language, the origin of government, the origin of culture, the origin of nations, the origin of religion, the origin of the chosen people, the origin of redemption. The book of Genesis is quoted and referred to more frequently than any other books in the Bible and is above all else the foundation of God's revelation to mankind. In the New Testament alone there is at least 200 quotes referred to from the book of Genesis. Jesus himself quoted around six times in relation to Genesis speaking of Noah's ark, the destruction upon the world. He spoke at different times and it was normally from the first 11 chapters in the book of Genesis he spoke from. So when Jesus spoke from it, this shows us that this is authentic. These 11 chapters are truth. It is interesting to note the first 11 chapters is quoted more in the New Testament than the rest of the book. Yet this portion, the first 11 chapters, which we're going to study over the next number of months by God's grace and help with these prayers and carriages, these first 11 chapters have been the object of the greatest attack by skeptics on unbelief down through the centuries as well as so-called liberal theologians today. And the psalmist reminds us if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? This book of Genesis is the foundation of all scripture. The book of Genesis, especially the first 11 chapters, being the foundation of scripture, shows how important it should be to every believer. And we need to study it and understand it as well as defend it no matter the cost because Peter reminds us all scripture, not just 99%, all scripture is by inspiration of God, God breathed, not just some portions or even 99% but 100% God breathed. Conservative scholars believe Moses wrote this book, Genesis, which was the first of the five known as the Pentateuch. In the book of Genesis, we can discover different generations. Be the generations of the heavens and the earth in chapter 1, be the generations of Adam in chapter 2, be the generations of Noah in chapter 5, be the generations of the sons of Noah in chapter 6, be the generations of Shem. Chapter 10, the generations of Terah, that was Abraham's father. Chapter 11, the generations of Isaac. Chapter 11 to 25, the generations of Jacob. Chapter 25 to 37, and then the generations of Jacob's sons, which formed the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. The book of Genesis is not only important as the history of man's origin, which is very important, of course. But also, it is a book of prophecy, man's future as well. Yes, the book of Genesis explains paradise lost, but becomes paradise regained in the book of Revelation. Let us discover here, you don't need to look at it, of course, but I'm just going to read this out. We can certainly see the comparisons between the original world in Genesis and the final world which is to come. Dear friends, there is a world to come. This whole world is going to be consumed, obliterated. And they're talking about climate change and this and that. If they don't even read the Bible, spending millions and billions, priorities all over the place, total confusion. Folly the way some of these thinkers and high circles 
think. And they only turn, you see, the wisdom of the word is foolishness for God, and they only turn to God's word, which is all wisdom. They would understand what is to happen. This world, this world is going to perish. This is a fallen world. Why is this? It's because of sin. Sin destroys. This is why we hear terrible tragedies. I can count you only ball the other day. This is what happens. Because we're in a fallen world, a sinful world, a dangerous world. But there's going to be a new world ushered in when Christ returns and Christ then sets up his kingdom and then after that the new heavens and the new earth will be ushered in. The new Jerusalem for the redeemed in Jesus Christ who are prepared for God's great eternity. I wonder today are you prepared? Are you saved? Are you in Christ? Have you truly repented and received Christ as Saviour? But I'm just going to put across here some of the comparisons between Genesis, the very beginning of Genesis, the temporary material world which we're in today. First of all, there was a division of the light and darkness. But in the eternal world to come, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, which will never be destroyed, it will go on forever and ever. God's people will be with Christ forever and ever, a place of perfect paradise, worshipping Him, serving Him, and reigning with Him forever and ever. No more pain, no more disasters, no more death, no more crying, no more pressure, no more attacks from the wicked one. A place of perfect harmony, love, peace, joy, a place where there's no sin, a place where there's no devil or demons. There's no night there. There's no night in the eternal world. But in this world we live in, there's day and night, light and darkness. In this world we live in, there's a division of land and sea. I was up at Port Stewart yesterday and beautiful looking out at the sea. But there's no more sea in the eternal world. Sea can speak, you see, of separation. In the world we live in, there was a need of sun and moon. We need the sun and the moon. But in the eternal world to come, for God's redeemed people who are saved by His grace, there's no need of sun and moon because the glory of God will shine, the radiance of God will shine for eternity. In the temporary world we live in, material world, in Genesis it spoke that man was made and prepared for a garden, the Garden of Eden. But in God's great eternal world of heaven, man is prepared and is, is made perfect in Christ uh, for a prepared city. In the temporary world, there was gold in the land, and heaven was gold in the city. In the temporary world, there was a white stone. In heaven, there's all manner of precious stones. In this world we live in, this fallen world, God was walking in the garden for fellowship with Adam and Eve. In heaven, God will be dwelling with his people forever and ever. In this temporary world, the, the, the ground was cursed, but there's no more curse that's removed in heaven. In this temporary world, there's daily sorrow. It is a reality, we all experience it. In heaven, there's no more sorrow. In this temporary world, there's thorns and thistles, and man has to work with the sweat of his face, and brow, and pressure, and frustrations. In heaven, there's no more pain, tears are wiped away. In the temporary world, people have to die physically, as well as spiritually if they're not in Christ. But in heaven, there's no more death. In this world we live in, folks, evil is continually, and it'll get worse, leading up to the return of Christ. In heaven, there's no more evil, there's no more sin. In this world we live in, we're in the battle against the enemy. He's like a roaring lion, seeking who he made his devour. He opposes, he hinders, he opposes the believer. In heaven, Satan is banished forever. He will be in the lake of fire. The 
because of man's sin, Adam was banished from the garden. But as God's people, we will have free entry to the city. And of course, in Genesis 3, it tells us about the Redeemer promise when man fell. And God in his mercy he sent Christ. And heaven, redemption is accomplished through and through. So it is evident from these examples that the book of Genesis is vital to give an understanding of the eternal purposes of God. Redemption, see, the redemption thread, the redemption plan from Genesis 3 right through the book of Revelation. So let us look here, first of all, today, at the beginning of these studies, these first 11 chapters of Genesis. We're just going to zoom in on verse 1. Verse 1. The first verse of the Bible. This verse is absolutely massive. It is the foundational verse of the Bible. It is massive. If you get this verse wrong, you'll get the rest wrong. Verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is why we're here today. God is our creator. No matter what the skeptics and people with evil parts of unbelief, what they think, man is out without an excuse, which we'll look at in a few minutes. If a person really believes this verse, he will more than likely not find it difficult to believe anything else recorded in the scriptures. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It wasn't by chance. There had to be a great designer, a great architect. Even the sun, if God allowed the sun to come closer to one degree closer to this earth, we would all be consumed. If God allowed the sun to go one degree less from the earth, we would freeze to death. There has to be a great designer who keeps everything in motion. God created the heaven and the earth. This verse alone shows us that God created all things, controls all things, and can do all things. Also this verse refutes man's foolish false philosophies concerning the origin and meaning of the world. They get into all types of confusion and come up with foolish philosophies. If a person tries to leave God out of the equation, life is meaningless. This verse refutes atheism as the universe was created by God. This verse refutes polytheism for God created all things. This verse refutes materialism as matter had a beginning. This verse refutes dualism because God was alone when he created the universe. This verse refutes humanism because God is the ultimate reality, not man. This verse refutes pantheism as God is far above all transcendent to that which he created. This verse refutes evolution because God created all things. Man's natural unregenerated state will come up with foolish philosophies. Because he wants to put God out of the equation, knowing far well that he is accountable to God, his creator, maker, and judge. The psalmist reminds us the fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Man is without an excuse because God has given every person a conscience. General Revelation, I was up and said yesterday up in Port Rush, Port Stewart, and you looked around and you see the beautiful ocean. When we look around us, when we look at creation, we should know within ourselves there's a God out there who's created us. David says, when you look up, you see the vastness of the space, the earth, the heavens, the clear, the glory of the Lord. Man's general revelation, man, is without an excuse. God has given us general revelation. He's given us a conscience. But most importantly, he has given us his full revelation, which speaks to us about Jesus Christ. The Word of God. 
old and new testament the full revelation nothing needs to be added on or taken away it is complete and god has spoken in these last days the last days folks started when christ ascended back to glory right through the time he will return and blaze in glory when every eye will see him there'll be no escape and god has spoken in these last days through his son it says and the hebrew writer reminds us every person in this world is without an excuse they should know there's a god out there a great designer a great architect a great the maker of the heavens and the earth and everything in it and then he's spoken he's given us his only begotten son the full revelation jesus said to philip if you see me you've seen the father they're without an excuse no matter what philosophies they come up with they get themselves in all types of confusion and mess and ignorance when they try to leave god out of the equation life without god is meaningless it is purposeless it is futility it is in vain they're going around in circles and circles moses was the instrument used by god who was inspired by the holy spirit and moses here in the beginning here in this first verse does not attempt to go into a great discourse to try to prove god created the heavens and the earth no moses just pens it inspired by the holy spirit that this is so obvious that only a fool could declare there is no god in verse one in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and this all important massive verse we need to unpack this morning or this afternoon it speaks first of all of in the beginning this phrase in the beginning now what does this mean in the beginning <coughs> does this mean in the beginning with god no it doesn't there's no beginning with god we can't understand that god is infinite god has no beginning or end god is eternal when it says in the beginning here it's to speak in here of a beginning of time god is outside of time god is eternal a thousand years to god is like one day to us god is eternal you see he's outside of time and when it says in the beginning it refers to the beginning of time in which god brought the universe into existence out of nothing the universe is actually a continuous sequence of elements such as space matter and time in which matter including energy must function in both space and time so to put it into simple words the transcendent omnipotent all-powerful god self-existent self-sufficient god called into existence the space mass time universe out of nothing he just spoke and it happened this is the god we're dealing with today he is infinite he is transcendent he is incomprehensible he is infinite he's the god who has created the universe and sustains it by the word of his power you see god is eternal he's outside of time god has no beginning or end god has always been god and always will be god we have a beginning there's a time to the born there's a time to die god does not die god is living the eternal god yes jesus christ took on human flesh but jesus in his in his godhood and the person second person of, of the trinity jesus who is god fully god did not die because god can't die jesus died in his humanity on the cross of calvary 
God is eternal. God can't die. God is living. And he's eternal. He's outside of time. Created time. And in the beginning it means here that there was a time when God created this universe. The name for God here is Elohim. You see there's all different names in the Hebrew for God like Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, Elohim. And what does that mean here? This word Elohim is different from Jehovah. In the Hebrew, this word God in verse 1, Elohim, it's mentioned actually 32 times in this chapter, which emphasizes his power and majesty. This is the omnipotent, all powerful, incomprehensible, transcendent, self existent God of glory. His power, folks, is beyond our comprehension. God has all power. God is not, has, has more power or less power. He's all powerful. And Elohim, referring to God here in the beginning, there was a time here. Elohim, God, this Hebrew name for God, it is actually a plural noun, which hints that God exists in three persons, of course, as the scripture reminds us, creation is attributed to the Father, Acts 4, to the Son, John 1, under the Holy Spirit, Psalm 104. God is one. God, yet three persons. He's incomprehensible. How do we get our head around that? We can't, but we believe it because the Bible teaches us that. Elohim, God, revealed his infinite power by creating everything, by merely Speaking everything into existence as matter, time, space is not eternal. Only God is eternal. Elohim, for the name of God, is a plural name with a singular meaning. One God, yet three distinct persons. What did Elohim, God, do at the beginning of time? It says in verse 1, He created. He created. In the beginning of time, God created. This word created is bara in the Hebrew, which is always only used regarding the work of God alone. Only God can create that is called into existence. That which has no existence. Only God can do that. No one else can do that. Man can't do it. Nothing else can do it. Only God, God is the only one who can create that which is called into existence. God just calls it into existence and it happens. No man can do that. Yes, man, God has given man great ability and woman great ability over the, over the years, even in this last hundred years of the technological advancement. But man can't create anything just out of no existence. It's impossible. There has to be someone. They're a material thing, whether it's a metal to build a cure or whatever. For a man to form it, man needs someone to be able to do that, shape it, and mold it. But God can create anything when He just speaks before it's even existence. God, in a supernatural, miraculous, infinite power, can speak things into existence whose materials had no previous existence before. Now that is mind -blowing. We need materials to create things, to form things, to design things. God can just speak and it happens. What an infinite, incomprehensible supreme being is the living, eternal God. This universe had no existence until by a creative act of God. This universe is very complex, orderly, in which a creator God is the only adequate cause to produce such effects. And what did Elohim God create here in verse 1? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, it says. He created the universe. 
The heaven here does not refer to the stores of heaven when we look up. Which God created on the fourth day of the creation week. It seems Moses is speaking about our modern term called space. Which involves a space, mass, time, universe. What about the word earth here in verse 1? That God created. At that particular time, the earth originally had no form to it in verse 2. So it's not the earth, planet earth we're on at the minute. That's what the verse isn't speaking about. That happens later on. Neither at the beginning of the initial creation there was no planet, stars, or material bodies in the universe until the fourth day. So this verse speaking of earth must mean the creation of the basic elements of matter which later on were to be organized in a structural earth consisting of material bodies. Someone said, Scripture does not reveal why God chose to start his creative work with the chaotic mass that was dark, formless, and empty, but the Holy Spirit brooding over the waters would bring order out of chaos and beauty and fullness out of emptiness, just the way he can do to his people who fully yield to him. Our lives before the Lord saved us was full of chaos and emptiness. But when the Lord saves you, he transforms you. He takes us a sinner, a vile sinner, out of darkness and transforms him and makes him into a holy man and woman of God to bring glory to his wonderful name. God is a God of order. According to some scholars, this great event in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth. It took place between six to 10,000 years ago. As far as the creation of the universe is concerned, some scholars believe this took place five days earlier, this event in verse 1. Five days earlier than the creation of man in, in the sixth day, as they take these days literal 24 hour periods. Because in the context, that's what is harmless 24 hours, day and night. Morning, evening was the first day of verse 5. These are 24 hour periods. But there is a, a modern gap theory which has come in to the church, which was revived in the 19th century by a scholar theologian called Thomas Chalmers. This gap theory unfortunately gives a platform for the evolutionists and also is destructive theologically. Now, don't get me wrong, there's some good men who believe in it and they're truly saved by the grace of God and godly men. But the danger arises if people embrace this gap theory between the literal six days of creation, huge periods of time between the literal six days of creation, that's what they believe in, the gap theory, that the word created 24 hours consecutively. But there was great gaps between it. Then the animals on man which God created there in the six days. The animals on man before the pre-Adamic fall, before the fall of Adam, must have existed then for maybe millions of years because death did not enter the world until Adam sinned. In my thinking, which is limited. I believe this gap theory is not even logical. I believe it is error. It is not sound biblical exegesis as it is misrepresenting scripture. It's taken out of context. That's why context is essential. The scriptures tell us that these were 24 hour days, evening and morning were the first day. In the Hebrew Old Testament, the word yom for day means normally as it refers either to a day in its normal 24-hour sense or a day-like portion 
of the 24 hours being distinct from night. There was an odd time it did refer to a period of time. But in the context on nearly all the time the word young referred to a normal 24 hour day. And in the context, just to reinforce it, in chapter 1, each day had distinct boundaries regarding each day's work. Even in the morning, it says, it consisted of 24 hours. Do people really think it would take God millions, if not billions of years, to create the universe and everything in it? Yet the Bible clearly reveals that to God six days in the context of this portion of scripture which we will study as we go along in the next number of weeks. 24 hour periods. Look verse 4. And God saw the light that was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening this evening and the morning were the first day. Even in the morning. We all know of morning time. We all know of evening time, what happens after the evening. Then there's a new day, morning comes again, 24 hours. If the Bible clearly reveals it took six days, 24 hour periods, and the Bible in the, in the, in the portion, if it is plain on simple language, the great danger then arises when people start reading into things by spiritualizing in which they come up with all types and fanciful erroneous speculations and ideas and theories. If the passage is simple folks, to do with biblical exegesis, if the passage is simple, clear and plain language, it should be taken literal. Not allegorical by trying to make it sound symbolic. There is portions of scripture like the book of Revelation, of course, is symbolic, allegorical at times. Nobody is disputing that on other passages of scripture. But there is the majority of scripture should be taken literal. So today here we've just looked at the origins, of course. God is outside of time, God is eternal, God is no beginning or end. We have this earth, this universe had a beginning. Today we've discovered the foundation of all the 31,102 verses in the Bible. Verse 1, this is the foundation of every other verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven on the earth. I wonder today, as God is your creator, do you know him personally? You see, sin separates us from the living God. God in perfect fellowship with Adam and Eve before sin entered the world. He came down every day and had perfect fellowship and then as a result, when they sinned, what happened? They were banished out of the garden. Have you fellowship today with your Creator? Because someday, every one of us, you're either going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, which is for the believer, in which Christ has dealt with our sins traditionally, praise His glorious name, but we will stand and give an account to us people who are saved to see how we've served them, how, how we've we been faithful to them down through the years. And then there's a great white throne judgment in which you will, the sinner who has never repented, who has never been saved, who has never been in Christ, who died in their sins, and they will go to the great white throne judgment. There is no escape. God is our creator. And all spirits, when our spirit leaves these bodies, they will go to God. And you're either going to go to glory, or dear friends, you're going to be judged like um, on the great white throne judgment by your creator, by your maker, and they end up cast into the lake of fire. 
बी वाइज एंड द प्राइस स्लेव इन रॉक कॉम देर इज नो स्किप दिस वर्ल्ड इज गोइंग टू रॉक अप सम डे और वॉल इज गोइंग टू रश टू एंड द न्यू हैपेंस ऑन द न्यू एर्थ ऑन द न्यू जर्सलम इज गोइंग टू सेंड एंड एंड टू ऑन God's people who are redeemed through Jesus Christ, who are gloriously saved, sins forgiven, will spend forever and ever eternally with the eternal God, His glorious Son, in which there will be no more tears, no more death, no more heartache, no more sin. Place of outstanding beauty, joy, peace, love. Paradise, harmony, forever and ever. Where are you going today? Is the question. Are you saved? Are you prepared to make this eternal, omnipotent, self-existent, incomprehensible, infinite God? What a supreme being he is! It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Prepare to meet thy God. Are you saved? Are you ready? Any one of us folks could be taken out into eternity. Sadly, that terrible event was happening on Friday afternoon. Probably some school children getting out of school and going to the, the local film station. A very wee small town on close knit community. And ten people just taken out in split seconds. Are you ready? Are you prepared? This is the Almighty God, really. He just spoke the word, the word of the universe and the existence. God didn't need material to create. He just spoke it. He is infinite. We are finite, limited creatures. Be wise. Turn to Christ while there's time, because there is no escape. We will meet Him someday. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And praise God, He's going to create the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem for His redeemed people in Jesus Christ. The Lord bless this word to us. This morning we'll sing our final hymn. It is staggering when we think of the God of all wonders, the Almighty God, the omnipotent, all-powerful God. We just spoke the, the word in this universe, just spoke it into existence, and how He loves us, how we have all offended Him, how we have all violated His law, how we have all been in rebellion against Him. It is the great God of wonders and how, in His mercy, He sent His Son to redeem a people unto Himself. Are you redeemed today? Have you sins forgiven? Are you in Jesus Christ? 344 of us conclude our meeting today. Thank you, Jesus, for this time, please. Mm -hmm.